In his book, The Secret Destiny of America, Manley P. Hall wrote that world democracy was the secret dream of the great classical philosophers, saying that the brilliant plan of the ancients has survived to our time and it will continue to function until the great work is accomplished. Many researchers believe this great work is the secret behind the wars and rumors of war America has been involved in through the 20th century, right up to the present day. Could this plan of the ancients to establish a world democracy be the real hidden agenda of secret societies? And was this ancient plan echoed in the 2005 inaugural address given by President Bush? When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. The occult is working at the highest levels of our society using the military and financial power of the United States to bring about this one world state. And the president has spoken openly about it, how the purpose of the United States is to bring democracy to the nations of the world. Where did this become the function of our nation to bring democracy to the world? You only need to read the writings of Manly P. Hall where he tells you that for 3,000 years secret societies have been working to bring democracy to the world. You read President Bush's speech you know, uh, before the Association on Democracy, the National Association of Democracy. He tells you for 2,500 years people have been working to bring democracy to the world. Yet the ancient philosophers recognized that a true democracy could only be achieved by a society of perfected men. A perfected man would be comfortable in a true democracy. And probably a true democracy cannot emerge until there is enough of such human beings in the world that can take over the government of man. It will be that kind of leadership. It will be like Plato's vision of the philosopher king, the man who has wisdom, and the man who has power. Democracy has the occult promise of a fair world to live in. Now, you, you mentioned the, the occult promise. How would you define a term like that for an audience who's... Well, probably uh, define that term by saying that 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 promise okay, is, is, is the word well, it's, obs it's, it's obscure, it's, it's uh, hidden, um, not visible to the normal eye. So an occult promise is something that is inherent, but only visible to those who have that inner vision. So, a fair world is a kind of occult promise at the heart of democracy. But is this occult promise part of America's Christian heritage? And if not, could this account for why the many symbols that adorn America's capital city come not from the Bible, but from the ancient mystery religion? And if America were really truly a Christian nation, what would all of these mythological uh, characters be in our city? Certainly the Christian influence was very strong. From the Christian point of view, we were formed as a Christian nation. But from the occultist point of view, and those associated with astrology and the ancient mystery religions, America was, of course, to, and Washington, D.C. was to represent their position. So you've had the two forces you know, in America ever since its formation. While it seems that most of America's leaders have upheld Christian ideals, their reason for doing so is often questioned. If they were Christians, why would they erect monuments to pagan gods and goddesses? And if they were pagans, why confess to Christian ideals? Manley Hall suggests the reason may have been one of self-preservation. He argues that because of the persecutions of organized religion in the old world, the secret societies employed even greater methods of secrecy to protect their occult philosophies, making themselves sound as though their beliefs had to do with Christianity, 
which was the dominant belief in Europe, and eventually America. He says, the pagan intellectuals reclothed their original ideas in a garment of Christian phraseology, but bestowed the keys of the symbolism only upon those duly initiated and bound to secrecy. It is for this reason that all secret societies have an initiation process whereby members are bound by blood oaths not to reveal the secrets of the order. A chief factor that contributes to confusion about the beliefs of America's founders is the presence of Rosicrucianism. The Rosicrucians are a mystical arcane society that played a major role in the development of Freemasonry. The rose and cross which symbolize the society are also the source of its confusion. The rose is the symbol of secrecy and represents the pagan mystery religions while the cross symbolizes Christianity. Rosicrucianism is when the two are combined. Because of this, one can begin to understand how a man like Charles Thompson could be famous for his English translation of the Old and New Testaments and at the same time approve the design of the Great Seal for the United States with the all-seeing eye of Horus floating over an Egyptian pyramid. Thompson was closely associated with a man named Peter Miller, a well-known 18th century Rosicrucian and the leader of the Ephrata community in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. The Ephrata cloister is believed to have been the first esoteric settlement in the New World, with connections to some of the founding fathers, such as Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. The early Ephrata movement clearly held mystical beliefs, even driving stakes into doorways to ward off evil spirits. We now know for a certain that they were Rosicrucians. It was Washington was close to these individuals, as well as Franklin and, Washington, and, and Jefferson. Benjamin Franklin even enlisted the aid of Peter Miller to translate the Declaration of Independence into a number of European languages and to inform the world of America's independence. The printing for these translations was done at the Ephrata Cloister. Peter Miller would have been further connected to many of the founding fathers through the American Philosophical Society, founded originally by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society's members included such prominent figures as Thomas Paine, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, the Marquis de Lafayette, George Washington, Charles Thompson, and of course, Peter Miller. Later members would also include such names as Charles Darwin and Thomas Edison. Franklin Society is thought to be directly related to the earlier concepts set forth by Sir Francis Bacon. According to Michael Howard in his book, The Occult Conspiracy, Franklin's American Philosophical Society was operated in the same tradition as the Royal Society in England, which was based on Sir Francis Bacon's Rosicrucian concept of the Invisible College. In the history of the Royal Society, they refer to the beginnings of the Royal Society came from a group of people who called themselves the Invisible College. The purpose of the Royal Society of London was to further Bacon's advancement of learning through scientific investigation. It is without question, however, that some of their work led to the metaphysical and the occult. And then we find that the Rosicrucians called themselves the Invis Invisible Brotherhood, and the, the College of Rosicrucians was therefore, or was called by them, the Invisible College. A Rosicrucian influence can be clearly seen in some of America's symbols. For example, this image of a pelican feeding her young appears in Manley Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages and is very common to Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Now notice the Great Seal for the state of Louisiana. This particular replica is found inside the inner corridors of the U.S. Capitol. The Temple Church in London is a well-known Knight Templar Church. Here we can see that the Golden Rosy Cross can be traced back to the mysterious knights. Now, notice the art surrounding the shrine. 
how a series of squares are shown with red and golden roses in the midst. The shrine opposite has a variation of the same design. Now consider this same pattern as it appears throughout the interior of the state capitol. Inside the old Supreme Court room and in various forms throughout the Library of Congress. Sir Francis Bacon became the chief of the Rosicrucians in England. His famous saying, knowledge is power, is found written inside the Library of Congress, while a statue of Bacon can be seen on the upper level. Elsewhere in the main library is a Baconian passage from his collection of essays. It reads, the inquiry, knowledge and belief of truth is the sovereign good of human nature. This saying is found over a statue representing philosophy. Could this be an indication that Baconian philosophy governs the New World concept? Bacon took his inspiration from the goddess Pallas Athena, known for her helmet of invisibility. Pallas Athena images also turn up throughout Washington, D.C. The Virginia State Seal bears the image of Athena with her foot upon a fallen king whose crown is cast aside. The word Six Semper Tyrannus, thus always to tyrants, written beneath. To the Romans, Athena was called Minerva. This painting of Minerva can be found in the Great Hall of the Library of Congress. At 15 and a half feet high, it is the most imposing image in the room. Notice she holds a spear that comes like a ray of light from the sun with a traditional helmet of Athena at her feet. This particular work was done by 19th century artist Elihu Vedder. Vedder was known as a symbolist painter whose style was part of a movement that can be traced to France during the 19th century and an art house called the Salon de la Rose Croix. Yes, they were a group of Rosicrucian artists known for promoting symbolic and often bizarre imagery. Some of which, like the image of this satyr, seems to be repeated inside the Library of Congress. It's not clear if Vedder himself was a Rosicrucian, but one of his chief influences certainly was. William Butler Yeats was a prominent member of the Golden Dawn, a Rosicrucian secret society. Yeats, along with Irish mystic William Blake, are said to be two of Vedder's leading inspirations. Vedder's own occult themes are filled with haunting esoteric imagery, like this work, which is called The Cup of Death. In addition to Minerva, Vedder was commissioned to do a series of paintings illustrating government, which can be found at the east end of the Great Hall in the Library of Congress. Now let's look again at this image from the Salon de la Rose Croix. It pictures Leonardo da Vinci on the right, dressed like Joseph of Arimathea, whom occultists believe was the original cupbearer for the Holy Grail. Beside him is Dante Alighieri, dressed as a Knight Templar. By now, most people are familiar with Da Vinci's arcane background thanks to Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Most are also familiar with Dante's Inferno representing the many circles of hell. But according to Michael Howard, Dante was no ordinary writer. He was in fact a Rosicrucian Grand Master who wove Rosicrucian philosophies into his writings. Masonic philosopher Albert Pike wrote that it was Dante who first publicly expounded the symbol of the Rose Cross. Something partly seen in William Blake's sketch of Dante's Paradise with a cross in the center. But now look at this drawing done by famed artist Gustav Doré. The title of Doré's illustration is, quote, the saintly throng in the form of a rose.